mute themselves as we'll be going live soon. Thank you. With the Almighty's blessing, let me start today's session with a poem by Bo Burnham. The squares lived happily in their square houses, in their square yards, in their square town. One day, a family of circles moved in from the west. Get out of here, Roundy, shouted one of the squares. Why? asked one of the circles. Because this is a metaphor for racism. Good evening to one and all present here. My name is Gail Pereira, and on behalf of Team Humanist at KJ Sumaya Institute of Management, I would like to welcome you all to this online panel discussion as a part of the 10th International HR Conference. This conference intends to shine a light on and discuss concerns that can steer us towards establishing a world free of discrimination and biases, as well as embrace true diversity and inclusivity. On that note, let's kick things off. We are delighted to have with us today our esteemed panelists, Dr. Lakshmi Bala Subramanian, Ms. Monica Nivandar, Mrs. Rekha Vijaykar, Mr. Shivakumar, Ms. Trishala, and the moderator for today, Dr. Vipul Vyas. We also welcome members from different institutions around the world. The director of KJ Samaya Institute of Management, Dr. Monica Khanna, our faculty members, and our very own KJ Samaya students. It's wonderful to have you all present with us today. Before we start the panel discussion, I would like to take a moment to dwell on this year's theme for the conference, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion. And as such, would like to call upon one of the conveyors of the conference, Professor Nikhil Mahindru, for a brief introduction and context setting. So, over to you. Thanks, Gail. Uh, what if I say that diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI, has the potential to drive global peace? Feeling intrigued? Well, just two days ago, we celebrated the International Peace Day and this year, the United Nations actually chose the theme as End Racism, Build Peace. A world free of discrimination is the key to experiencing real peace, isn't it? But the problems facing DEI may perhaps be classified as wicked problems, those that are extremely complex and multidimensional. Why do I say so? Let's take sustainability, for example. One world is all we have. Climate action has become the buzzword and electric vehicles or EVs as they are called are being pitched as cleaner, greener and sustainable solution. But are they? They hide beneath the story of blood batteries, the term coined by Vion in one of its recent reports. In fact, these cars or EVs are actually fueled by child labor and unimaginable inequity. How? 70% of supply of cobalt required to make these EV batteries come from one country in Africa, Congo. At least 40,000 miners at Congo are children and some are as young as actually six years old. And they stare at death almost every day. They make as little as $1 while the global industry of cobalt is actually pegged at $13.6 billion by 2027. But that money never comes or reaches their home. Forget the money. Many of the miners don't reach their homes. It is estimated that almost 2,000 miners lose lives every year trying to just earn that extra buck. 
clearly there is a human rights violation and a wicked DEI problem wrapped in the garb of being sustainable. And the list of such wicked problems in the space of DEI is really long. Research, however, indicates that wise leadership is one of the best ways to solve wicked problems. Right now, we are truly blessed that we have amongst us six wise leaders in the form of panelists who have not only navigated, but they continue to address such diverse wicked problems relating to DEI, not just at the level of doing, but at the level of being with clear awareness that their thoughts and actions have deep and far-reaching impact. It's time to celebrate their wise leadership. I am sure that many of us would be touched, moved, and inspired by them and their journey, which will also help them multiply their impact by each one of us wanting to do more and be more. So let's get started now. Thank you, sir, for that wonderful introduction. I would now like to take a moment to introduce our esteemed panelists and moderator with rich experience and belonging to diverse backgrounds. They will then take the discussion forward. We have with us today, Dr. Lakshmi Bala Subramanya. She is a lecturer and researcher at Stanford University and has presented dissertation research on inclusive education for diverse disabilities. Dr. Lakshmi has proposed to restrict every barrier that prevents an inclusive education setup and pivoted on embracing an inclusive pedagogy with, uh, for students with disabilities. We also have with us Ms. Monica Navandar. She is a certified coach with 17 plus years of industry HR experience. She is the founder of Neo7 Solutions, a premium HR and business consulting firm. Neo7 Solutions um, guides organizations on diversity and inclusion, leadership development, cultural transformations, talent management, and, it, and HR capability. Ms. Navander has worked on books and has been on the Harvard Business Review and Advisory Council for five plus years. She's also a frequent DEI speaker on worldwide platforms. We have with us Mrs. Rekha Vijaykar, who has over 33 years of experience in the field of education, currently serves as Assistant Director of ADAPT, and is a significant contributor to receiving the British Council International Award for her school. She has worked for eight plus years as the senior director of a special needs children's center and introduced non-conventional teaching programs like the Playway Method, Theory of Five Senses, and Inclusion Program. We also have with us Mr. Shiva Kumar, with over 32 years of working experience with ITC. He is currently working as group head Agri and IT Business at ITC Limited. He has been part of the Farmers Cooperative and pioneered a farmer empowerment initiative called eChopal during his time at Divisional Head at ITC. He currently serves as a board member for the Advisory Council of the Ministry of Rural Development on the National Rural Livelihood Mission. He has also been part of numerous boards, including SEBI, IRMA, NABAD, World Economic Forum, and UN's Global Compact Core Advisory Group. We also have with us Ms. Trishala, who is a Training and Partnerships Officer at Perry Ferry. The organization works to provide transgender persons with skills training and job opportunities, catering to LGBTQIA plus sensitization, readiness services to corporates, and diversity and inclusion policy consultation. Mr. Shala is an artist, human resource professional, and grassroots community worker. Our moderator for this evening is Dr. Vipul Vyas. Dr. Vyas has got his MBA and doctorate in emotional intelligence way back in 2005. He has 24 years of academic and HR facilitation experience. His MDP and FTP solutions are based on emotional intelligence training. 
He has trained more than 4,000 professors at 44 universities and institutes in 10 states and more than 5,000 senior professionals trained at reputed organizations like RBI, ISRO, LNT, Tata, ZRDO, IIT Madras, Amul, CAG, Sun Pharma, and many more. Dr. Vyasa's training is often recalled by the participants as a spiritual makeover. We are extremely honored to have you all with us today. Can we give them a Zoom clap, please? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Go ahead, Gail. We shall now be commencing the panel discussion. I would like to request uh, you all to direct your questions to Q&A in the chat box. I now call upon Dr. Vipul Vyas to take the discussion forward. Um, I feel extremely privileged, um, honored, and humbled to join such a learned uh, team of panelists, of professors, and uh, such a reputed institute uh, in India, KJ Sumaya Institute of Management. And of course, the young minds who have joined um, from institute as well as from the other parts of country and internationally. I welcome on my behalf all the panelists. And uh, uh, before I start, uh, uh, will I have opportunity and permission to share the screen where I would like to share one commercial which will set the tone of this equity, diversity and inclusion uh, theme. So can I get permission to share the screen, please? The message that I get is host disabled participant screen. Yeah, sure. Uh, can we make sir, the co-host, please? Yeah, just make the co-host. That's what I was going to say. Just a few summit for this. Because the a theme that we have is on equity and diversity and inclusion, such a complex, each one terminology itself is very deep and very complex. And when we want to give justice to all these three together, it, it requires a lot of um, ability to connect, uh, to understand the needs and uh, requirements and wants of the people who need this support. Uh, so I thought it would be great if we start with a kind of visualization, which conveys a lot about how society see them and how they also see themselves. So not just mindset change, which is required at the societal front about them, uh, but also they need to break their own uh, uh, conditioning and how they have you know, perceived themselves, um, those communities which need the support. So there is one wonderful advertisement which I wanted to share. Yeah, now share I have now. the ability yeah. to share the, yeah, yeah, I can now. Please. Sir. So I'm just sharing it. Is it visible? Yes. Yes. Yes, it is. Ye kinnar bhi na parishan karne aa jate hain. Arey nee nee maaji, us lene nee dene aayi hu. Bagal mein meri chai ki dukaan hai, aur baris mein sab atke huye the, to sochi sabko ek ek cup chai pila do. Lijiye. लीजिए ना ला आप भी लीजिए आती हो आ अरे सुनो हाँ जरा इधर आओ अरे नहीं नहीं माजी आज पैसे नहीं लूँगी 
पैसे कौन दे रहा है सदा सुखी रहो so here we saw uh, how society has complex and conditioning about these people and how they also have started perceiving themselves uh, like how others see them so in first half we saw that maji got a shock treatment when that lakshmi says that maji kuch lene nahi dene aayi hu and then second time when maji calls her to bless her then it was her turn to get a shock treatment from the maji when she says maji aaj kuch lungi nahi and maji says kaun paise kaun de raha hai sadar sukhi raho friends uh, this is the situation in society where all these uh, categories uh, towards them the society at large have a mindset opinion perception beliefs and they themselves have also accepted that yes they are like that and this is where the whole game lies between this mindset it is said that the uh, mindset with which we meet the situation will decide how situation will meet us with this i would like to invite uh, uh rekha madam uh, mm. one of the most uh, senior and the one who has spent three decades um, working with children uh, having various uh, kind of uh, challenges uh, madam i just want to know and from all the panelists one by one uh, what made you interested and passionate about doing something for this sector how you got interest uh, towards uh, contribution in this particular area and if you can share some story some anecdotes uh, yes. it would be very much helpful to everyone thank thank you doctor i would like to say first i was in a mainstream school and always had a passion to teach at that time also i i wasn't aware of this uh, you know otherwise able because during our time there were no special schools we were all together my classmate was mr now they call it now i know it was mr or i had a classmate who had polio so we did not have now when you start when uh, they started segregating specials and giving them therapy these classes have been uh, you know have emerged which is sad in a way otherwise we were all included i was in a inclusive school i i was born with shivaji by the way so you know it dates back to that that era so it was it was then that but now i have realized that every child is different every, all of us if i if you take a look at all of us sitting here we are unique in our own way all right but nobody understands our uniqueness till you know you are you make them aware and nothing wrong in telling them this is what i i am this is what i like not this is not diversity this is in i'm talking from inclusion point of view so when i came to in the mainstream i started getting students from adapt adapt has a policy of you know make uh, bringing these children to a certain level and when that first child came i was happy to take generally from adapt you get regular uh, uh, special educators coming to help you so they would ask me do you need help and i said no i don't require because my way of uh, you know teaching in the in the classroom for all for all the teachers was project method now project method would take care of everybody whatever kind of you know learner that person was and that used to be fun love loving way of learning and another was nlp that is neuro lingo policy of course nlp is a vast subject but pertaining to education because unless all our five senses are not aroused no concept is clear so this was my way my passion was here to make people make, make children know otherwise in school you will remember somebody not good in maths is d in in at least in marathi they say d in maths or d in language but the child doesn't know or couldn't tell the teacher teacher you did not reach out to me because i i know what is maths i know how to count but teach me in my way the whatever is you know easy for me 
So NLP is when five senses are aroused. The simple thing to understand NLP is nowadays we shop on Amazon and you ask for a black uh, material. And when it comes, you're all disappointed. I say, eh, this is not the uh, black I asked for. Why? Because all our five senses could not be used on Amazon. So when you use all your five senses, that concept is absolutely clear. And the, when, the, when you start understanding, remember, your interest in the subject also increases. So that happens with children when you give them something which is understood by them, they understand better. So that was the passion part of it. And when I came to this ADAPT school and was with this, uh, you know, I don't like to use the word disability, otherwise able children, I found that they are the most happy children because we look at them and say, oh, I think he, he, he can't walk. So, but the child doesn't look at you and say, oh, how well this lady can walk. No, such thoughts <laughs> don't come to them. They are so, you know, uh, down to earth, I would say. And there is no bickering amongst them. And so when I had these children in my school at that time, they mm -hmm. also did not feel it because each one was in doing whatever they want. And a little story I will tell you. When I had first uh, child, who, the child was hearing impaired and mute. But she, immediately, as we said, the children are easy to you know, become buddies. And immediately, these children have a buddy. And this buddy, once when I saw her going you know, during, after the school was over, she was yet climbing the, uh, the, uh, into the school. I said, why are you going up? She said, I'm going up to get my book. And she was making actions. Then I realized she was the buddy of that child who was with hearing impaired and, uh, you know, uh, nonverbal. So this is what children have, have taught me. That this children, this child taught me that you don't require any, any actual learning of that sign language. You can use your way of making it known. So perhaps, you got, so perhaps you got very inspired from the your children themselves and yes, not interested yes, and yes. passionate about yes, how they yes. connect uh, yes. without any bias or conditioning yes. in their mind. They see yes. just see the human in front of them. Wonderful, yes. madam. Thank you so much. Uh, Shukumar, sir, if I may come to you now. Um, we studied during our MBA 19... 93, 94, about each Opal. And I never thought that I will have opportunity to see you. Uh, <laughs> it, it was in Philip Kotler book, by the way. And then it was used as a case study for all of us. So please share your ideas about how you got involved about this Opal idea. There is, there is inclusivity concept. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Professor Vyas. I think pretty much like how uh, Nikhil started the conversation by saying there are wicked problems. They are not unique to EV going back to uh, some young children in Africa. It's pretty widespread in the global chain. And same was the case in agriculture. If you look at consumers, uh, we pay 100 units of something as a price. Uh, what goes back to the producer is anywhere between 30 and 60 uh, at the maximum. And in order to produce it, there is a huge amount of uh, drudgery, uh, not necessarily the kind of blood that we saw in case of those batteries, but necessarily uh, very, very small uh, earnings. So I mean, these are uh, quite uh, extensive in all the value chains. And therefore, one of the triggers is that uh, you know this situation of status quo is not acceptable, is rather shameful for us as a society. Uh, the other trigger is that if you want to just solve them at a transaction level, you won't be able to solve them. Uh, if, you, if you say that, if you say inclusivity, uh, let me also extend it to uh, gender diversity in employment or uh, employing uh, differently abled people and, and so on. But at a transaction, if you say, I want to hire more women, the first response typically is what problem is there? I'm working in a remote village in agriculture. I won't be able to send women officers into villages late night. 
or I am running factories, I won't be able to employ uh, people uh, who are not fully able because it's hazardous. So the transaction level is typically these kind of responses. So what really got further uh, uh, me interested and got really passionate is that to solve these, you need to look at a higher order input into these. By higher order, I mean, we, we uh, Rekhaji talked about how do you see people differently able as opposed to disabled. Now that needs to be a conviction going beyond a nomenclature. Uh, as another example from ITC, if you were to say visually impaired people, some of you would have read that uh, ITC Mangaldi brand is employing a host of them as fragrance sensors because it is quite uh, commonly known that if there is one sense which you are not having right, the other sense could be heightened. And we saw that minor difference in fragrance uh, mm -hmm. can be identified by these people much better than even machines, as well as uh, all of us uh, mm -hmm. uh, who are otherwise seen as having many other senses working. And, and therefore, how do you get them, train them and deploy and create a whole system. So it starts with a conviction. And similarly, if you were to look at uh, other aspect of uh, uh, what is a, a higher order problem solving is how do you create enablers? When we found that employing women uh, by a few numbers in our factories is a problem because they are not ready-made skilled women in those locations in tier two, tier three, tier four kind of towns or villages where the factories are there, we said, let's get into the full value chain, get into training and hire women in much larger numbers. When we started this initiative in our first uh, factory, uh, only about 10% of all uh, women uh, were uh, we could employ, but the most recent in uh, Medak in 2021 has 100% women employed because it's a six month training where about twice as many as the jobs that are there that you really uh, start training. And, and then over the course of six months, there is uh, an engagement from both sides. Many of them say that, look at this job is right for me or not right for me. And I shift into something else. And, and at the end of that engagement, you see that you are able to uh, get onto this. Therefore, how do you look at expanding the horizon to get into a much longer training input to be able to get there? And, and finally, to say that you know, when you see the result of all of this uh, is, is what really gets you passionate to scale this up much more, uh, whether you engage with uh, building toilets in villages, where you say that you know, if you need toilet. If you have land, you can build one, but what do you do with landless? Uh, when you create uh, communities to think through and come with solutions like how do I build community owned and community based toilets, uh, the way it, it creates dignity and therefore what can be solved, then you see results of that kind uh, and then be able to do it on scale uh, is, is when you really get passionate. So it, it's a whole range of possibilities. Uh, is what I'm talking about uh, to, to get the spread of uh, the, the diverse ITC and how different parts really work. But the core is that the problems as they exist are not sustainable. Solving them at transaction level doesn't work. And therefore, you need to elevate it to a level where uh, you see what is glass half full in solving it, not glass half empty. And that's the example of differently able that I talked about with the conviction there. And uh, finally, look at enablers uh, rather than just, again, a, a transaction level kind of solution. And when you see the results, uh, then it has the spirit of uh, multiplication that is really possible. I think this is something very amazing story, sir, you have shared in very nutshell, but we can visualize and understand the kind of huge issue and challenges and problems that you and your team must have faced those days when you started working with uh, the this section where the 
education is the issue, the infrastructure is the issue, the social stigma and cultural uh, issues are there, literacy is the problem, and of course the skill is the problem. But hats off to you and your team who, who showed the path to entire corporate and industry those days that this is the way out to help. And I, I feel that it requires not just IQ and EQ, but also a lot of SQ that you have uh, applied at, at your end. Uh, uh, thank you so much, sir. Let me now go to uh, Trishala. Uh, Trishala, you represent a wonderful organization. You just shared during informal discussion about how you work in your organization. You are one of the founding member of Periphery. Please share your story, how you got interested, involved, passionate about working for transgender community for our young minds here. So I uh, grew up in Chennai and I did my master's in a social work college. So mm -hmm. uh, my, I must say my college is very, very inclusive and they made all efforts to, for us to give the opportunity to be exposed to different communities. So in my final year, we had uh, our culturals and uh, all of the judges and uh, who had come for the event were all from the transgender community. And mm -hmm. it was quite fascinating for me to actually, so I've seen them mostly on the roads and uh, for me to see a different part of them, a different um, you know, kind of uh, kind of the behavior that they put forward and the talent that they uh, that that they actually showcase, and um, so I happened to interact with a few of them, and then I asked them, you know, what they do for a living, and uh, it, it was quite surprising for me that they mentioned that um, they do most mostly creative arts, and uh, that's the safer space for them to be in, and and that they really don't uh, see themselves working in a mainstream society as such. Uh, mainly because there is a lack of awareness uh, with, within the community, I mean, uh, of the community uh, from the society itself. So um, once I graduated, I came across uh, uh, my, so founder is my friend and we studied in college together previously. And then uh, when I came across Periphery, I thought I'll, um, I can use my uh, education and the qualification and the experience that I have in actually uh, kind of directly impacting the community. So I think it comes from the from a lot of values that my college has inculcated inculcated in me, and uh, I was uh, you know happily able to uh, implement that in periphery, and it's been five years now, and um, we see uh, close to hundred and more than uh, one hundred fifty people reaching out to us every month. Uh, they're very eager to uh, uh, you know be in the corporate space, uh, mainly in tech. They want to explore themselves, and also that's happened to be a market that's. Uh, highly, uh, you know, increasing the opportunity that is increasing. And so we've had, we've seen a lot of people come by and, uh, you know, they want to be employed and they want to be uh, independent. So I think um, I saw Periphery as an organization that's solving a unique problem and it's the first of its kind organization as well. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just happy to be in this journey of, uh, you know, providing more opportunities for the community itself. So wonderful to know your passion, your interest. And I, I, I can feel from your words how passionate, how kind-hearted, how talented that you that I must do my career and profession and life and my studies. Otherwise, you would have gone to any multinational organization and uh, you know uh, pursue the normal career which other people are doing. But now you are on a different path and wonderfully contributing to the uh, human life. Thank you so much, Trishala, for sharing your wonderful journey. Uh, can I now reach to Dr. Lakshmi, who is from Stanford University with us. Um, uh, Lakshmi, this must be a different uh, time zone for you and you are maybe <laughs> awake with us. But uh, well, uh, we would like to know from your journey, uh, you have done your research in the area of uh, what could be done for the special children to help them um, gain normal, regular routine education with other students? Please share your journey, how you picked up this specific topic and subject in your for your thesis, for your research work, and um, what major findings you can highlight for our students here and participants, please. Thank you, Dr. Vyas. Uh... So I'm going to also say before I begin that I use students with disabilities or individuals with disabilities, and sometimes also use the word disabled. 
And that is because there are a lot of people who want the identity first language. They want people to stop seeing disabled as a negative connotation, but instead want to accept that identity, um, as especially within the deaf community in the United States, as well as um, people on the autism spectrum who sometimes prefer to be called autistic. So to respect both, I'll kind of toggle between both of those uh, phrases. Uh, but I'm a researcher and practitioner in the field of inclusive education. That is, I work at the system level and programmatic level to include students with diverse disabilities alongside their typical peers. I work within school settings, kindergarten to 12th grade, and in higher education, colleges and universities. My positionality is influenced by my identity as a disabled woman, my role as a special education teacher, and now a researcher, and my views about inclusive education. I'm a partially blind individual with no night vision and significant loss of peripheral vision. My own educational journey affected my assumptions, opinions, and values. It afforded me the opportunity to understand how it feels to never see what was written on the board, um, my repeated pleas were met with open your eyes fully or you need new glasses. It is salient to note that I was educated in India and Dubai during the 80s and 90s when accommodations for the disabled were rare, if not entirely absent. Knowledge of how I see the world has prompted people to verbalize pity or empathy, laugh awkwardly, or even increase the volume of their voice as though that would help me see better. These experiences inform my partial understanding of the reality inhabited by disabled individuals, including the students and their families who are part of my research. I consider myself to be a strong advocate of disability rights, which propels my interest and commitment to inclusive education. As a special education teacher, I conceptualize the model of inclusive education that is now being implemented in schools in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I work diligently at both the grassroots and the upper management levels, advocating with the school district personnel for program funding. As a researcher with an avid interest in inclusive education and disability rights, I place myself on the side of the debate that advocates for inclusion for all, including individuals with extensive support needs. And I focused my work on building systems. And one of the things um, that I've done is actually um, built a conceptual framework that I can elaborate on probably in the next round. I'm just being mindful of time. Um, Dr. Vyas, you can tell me if you want me to go further or um, if you'd like me to kind of hand the floor back to you. Uh, we, will, we will get back to you in the second round, but uh, it was very touchy uh, information that you shared. And uh, let me tell you, unless you share this information about your story, no one would, would, would judge or believe or assume about the issue that you have about your visibility. But uh, in India, uh, uh, the Prime Minister Narendra Modi has coined a word where he did not call anyone uh, disabled or physically challenged, etc. Um, the coined word is Divyang. Uh, the person is Divyang, meaning by person has special uh, abilities and has Divya qualities, divine abilities. When one aspect of uh, uh, one sense is, is weak, the other sense is uh, goes up as Shiv Kumar, he was also mentioning. Uh, so great to know your uh, personal story and also how you are now contributing through your research uh, to the society. Um, uh, Monica, now I, 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 I wish to learn from you, your story and your passion and interest about this, this area. Um, and I think uh, you are uh, having a very wonderful group of um, facilitator consultants uh, with your organization. So you have very wide exposure. Please share your story. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vyas. I want to start off with this is the first time I speak to the audience. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, mm -hmm. everyone. So glad to be here. Gail, you have such a beautiful voice. What a great job to start the forum. And to N Professor Nikhil Mahindru, Thank you for all the kind words on behalf of all of us. And it's interesting, um, Dr. Rekha, uh, sorry, uh, Rekha ma'am, what you said, like speaking about equality and equity at the same time, how you treat everyone equally, but also be mindful 
of what each person needs and how all of us are unique. Uh, thank you, Lakshmi, for bringing that point that we should call them people with disabilities. So in corporate world, and I agree with what you're saying, Dr. Vyas. Yes, Modiji did coin that term. However, if you speak to people with disability, they don't want to be named as Divyank or anything else. They don't want to be called as specially able, differently able. They want to be known as people with disabilities. And what they would call us is people with able bodies. So we are able-bodied people. So there's no normal or especially able or differently. I just want the students also to know that's the language you use in the corporate world. It is people with disabilities. And uh, uh, yeah, I think I summarized well of whatever notes I had taken. So uh, coming back to what got me interested and passionate mm -hmm. about the subject. So diversity, equity, and inclusion is my ekigai. And for those of you who don't know what ekigai is, it's a Japanese concept. It is actually purpose or reason for living. So DEI is my ikigai. I've been a practitioner in this space for like eight years now. And my personal slogan is be authentic and be yourself. And hence, I really appreciated Lakshmi when you shared your disability. That's being authentic. That's being yourself. So kudos, kudos to Trishala, by the way, and kudos to Periphery as well. So personally, I have been fortunate to uh, work and live in different countries and in um, both like the developed market as well as uh, the developing countries. And it's been across, uh, across industries, across various levels. So I've done roles at world headquarter level. I've been in the region. I've worked at country level. So diversity, you know, when you ask me, it really starts from within. And then personally, I come from a very diverse background. So I have, I have like multiple areas of interest, hobbies and skills. So growing up, actually, I used to call myself a jack of all. I worked with an event management firm back in my engineering days. I used to organize and host shows. So I used to be this compare or MC, what you want to call. I've acted in a regional film. I did modeling when I was super lean. I've dubbed my voice for a documentary. I used to sing and dance professionally to support uh, my education and my family. And then I have played various sports too at a district and state level. So all that I say is diversity comes from you too. So how diverse are you? And then I used to be a college topper. I've led student organizations and that's why I used to call myself Jack of all. And uh, I want to specifically bring back uh, to growing up like my upbringing one of my maternal aunts is both uh, deaf and mute, so my Masi, and uh, the teacher who had the most impact on my life uh, by helping me improve my English language skills. She's from the LGBT plus community. One of my brother-in-laws is below, new, uh, below knee amputee, and then many such other examples, which are now surprising that all these people actually had jobs and government <laughs> jobs as well as private jobs. Um, and I'm talking about my hometown, Aurangabad, so not a big place back then, but the stories are from 20, 25 years back. So I think that's, that was more of an inclusive environment. So the place I come from was quite inclusive. And I could only connect the dots when I embarked on my corporate journey within diversity, equity and inclusion with one of the best, Johnson & Johnson. So when I moved to the U.S., uh, to pursue my master's in HR from Rutgers, uh, which is the State University of New Jersey. I also, you know, happened to assist uh, two professors. So one is the Professor Doug Cruz. So he works into policymaking in the White House, and he's on the President's Committee for Employment on People with Disabilities. And he's worked on several studies. So one of them also being like Americans with Disabilities Act, and he's also an economist. So he had met with a car accident when he was really young, and then he had a spinal cord injury. So that resulted in paraplegia. And what paraplegia means is uh, no sensation from waist down. And then uh, another professor, she's a worldwide celebrity, uh, Professor Paula Kalajiri. I worked with her on a book called Cultural Agility. So that's when, that's during her assignment that I really got interested in <laughs> doing global work and getting uh, my hands on global assignments, and then understanding the meaning and importance of diversity and inclusion. So it's extremely important that since we have a global audience today, you know, also to understand the cultural differences and norms to actually get the work done in a global team. So yes, the master set me up well for a role with j, &J global office of DEI, and then just working 
at the world headquarter level, then when you know as an Asian millennial female that your work is actually touching 130,000 plus employees and you're just working two levels away from the CEO. So that feeling was just different. And that's my journey. Like that's how I got into DEI, Dr. Vyas. Wonderful. Great to know your very, um, uh, I would not call you a jack of all, but I would call you or a divers, I will call you versatile, which may be, which may sound rather proper. Uh, great. Nice to know, Monica. Uh, let me now follow the same, um, uh, same sequence and order of speakers so that there won't be any surprise to, for the speakers too. <laughs> Starting with Rekha, Madam. Uh, Madam, can we have your view on uh, uh, how you practice and how you apply uh, these three concepts uh, in, in your professional you know, work. Thank you, doctor. Uh, pardon me for not agreeing with one, one thing here when it was talked about disable, because if, if you look into the dictionary, the meaning of disable is machines get disabled. All right. When there is no power in the machine, that machine is disabled. And at no stage is human being without power. So it is ability or inability. But we are nowhere to change the nomenclature. It has come to stay. But as far as you personally can use the word, that's why I, I like to avoid the word disability. Because we cannot change the what has been there. Anyway, talking about diversity, before going to the world and the various, in our own country, from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, it's diversity. And today the situation is, it's not only that in every state for Maharashtra is, we'll have a Kashmiri, we'll have from Assam, we'll have from all the states. So we are all now with diversity and how do we address that? Now, one thing I would like to say, I learned from my father one thing, father, in, I, was, I was in a Catholic school and we had to go to church every Wednesday. And after a long time, almost four or five years of that, one of my classmates comes and tells me, my father says, why should we go to church? And you know, at that time I came home, I was talking to my father. And he, so one question was asked by my father, do you have any problem kneeling down? I said, no, that was the end of it. So you require somebody to, you know, at that age. Now, the second part was, I am a grandmother now. My grandson taught me when I was telling him, what is Gudi Padwa for us? We are Hindus because now every family has a mixed culture. As I said, the mother is from North. So she has never seen what is Gudi Padwa. So I said, Gudi Padwa is when you do. Before I could complete it, he said, but Aji, I thought I was an Indian. There you are. So this is how diversity is understood. It can be diluted by simple things like this. So when it, to dilute this diversity, what, what we do in schools also, we celebrate all the festivals, be it Eid, be it Goody Padwa, all, all. And I tell you, parents have to be, you know, educated on that because when I, I was in a sick organization where there is no uh, idol uh, uh, puja or, uh, you know, what you call Murti Puja. So there was Ganpati uh, decoration and was kept in the kindergarten class. Now, all this comes as general knowledge to children. I got one father walked into my office and asked me, ma'am, you should know that we do not believe in this. I said, it was not a puja puja as such. It was just a demonstration of what the uh, uh, Ganesh, uh, or what that festival is about. No questions were, and, and you know, what was the answer? Well, that is all right. Even I go to Siddhi Vinay. Hey? <laughs> so this is, this, is the, this is the, you know, uh, way people react. So we have to be, you know, very proactive. So this is one way we dilute diversity at school level. Nothing is, you know, different. Every prayer is also in different languages. It, when we were saying Sikh prayer, it was translated in English what it means because sometimes parents are in the assembly hall. We do it. Now here we say Gayatri Mantra. I translated it because I have all religion people. So nobody needs to take. And if you see all these prayers, 
there is nothing uh, uh, you know there's no christ in that english prayers there is nothing in that granth sahib there is nothing in gayatri mantra will say devi or whatever it is the meaning of that is simple dear god thou art in heaven that is that is it so when you say all this this is the basis because children don't have as i said children don't have this they are you know with you to say all the prayers but the adults with them will carry this message so there you have to dilute this diversity and then inclusion inclusion is what is as i said is an attitude i see i don't know if i ask you on this panel nikhil i don't know if nikhil knows how to make round rotis nikhil can you i'm sure you will say no but nobody calls Sorry. nikhil <laughs> nobody calls nikhil roti disabled does is it that so i can't save myself i uh, to uh, and sing i can't sing nobody calls me musically disabled so why why is this you know why do we say he can't walk so he is uh, 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 otherwise able so this you have to your attitude every person's attitude has to change and when our attitude changes as i said again shower principle if you when you are running an institution you have to be explicit in how you deliver how you communicate and if you have done that in a in a neutral way you have won the case thank I you sir think, yeah rekha madam i think you are at a very nice space where you can decide and command and implement and you can make it happen and possible because there are young kids and also parents who would listen to you but this is a kind of a little safe uh, space for you let me go to shiv kumar sir sir you are yeah, you are from very big organization how your organization ensure and practice this inclusivity unity and diversity uh, specifically in this uh, agro uh, and it sector that you heads there in firstly it starts with the belief that you not know, diversity means richer discourse diversity means broadening the perspectives and not Uh, and I versus you are, I am different, and this is the way. I think that belief, uh, when it really is the starting point, and when uh, that is experienced, that becomes uh, a, a top-down and all-pervasive in an organization. You obviously in a large organization, you you start with a, a policy which is based on this belief system. and and then you uh, build systems and actions so that uh, there is something which is practiced uh, by everybody and then the newer people which come in uh, also inculcate uh, a similar kind of uh, dna and then build bring in their own perspectives and that gets assimilated so the the, the practice uh, would include to start with an expression you know how do you ensure that everyone gets an opportunity to express uh, different fora get created uh, for expression as may be required uh, whether it is the uh, stakeholder consultations when it is outside the boundaries of organization when you say talk about agri there is an engagement with farmers and the Uh, landless laborers and the uh, uh, households so therefore uh, a stakeholder consultation so an expression uh, an important element is that how do you draw out and hear people who otherwise don't express or don't have an opportunity to express and that becomes a very important element when you say okay let's uh, talk it's quite normal that only 10% of the, all the people talk 80% of the time but how do you ensure that you actually draw out and then when you draw out and hear acknowledge the points which are made so that people are able to come out that really the the first part in terms of how do you really uh, uh, create that level of diversity the next element is really in terms of uh, the the redressal where whenever people feel that i am excluded i am making a point it's not enough to stop with expression you find a way to say that that issue which is being brought up is really resolved and uh, that resolution uh, whether 
uh, it is uh, an opportunity which is not given uh, our uh, uh, some area where there's a difference of view and then how do you really create a forum for that uh, engagement and conversation and get that redressal done and, and finally again to practice this on a large scale you need to create enablers and support systems uh, that I talked about a little earlier I mean how do you create uh, uh, the policies uh, and infrastructure that will ensure that uh, the support is available whether it was in the form of training that I talked about uh, in one context uh, or uh, you know for example uh, traveling is integral part of jobs now uh, when mothers come back with infant children and are expected to travel uh, a policy to ensure that uh, there is uh, someone who is uh, assisting and uh, uh, traveling along as a caregiver and that cost is also taken care of is an example of a support system if you say that in an expression somebody says yeah i i am expected to travel i am not to perform as well because i can travel together with my uh, young child and therefore i am falling behind so how do you ensure that that support system comes so i think that is the continuum uh, in the framework to say that you have an expression then you also have redressal and then you have uh, a support system to make it happen. So I think the, the issues in a, in a larger organization uh, is, is obviously something which is systems driven to make all of this happen. But it all again starts with a conviction that all of this adds value and this is how we are able to uh, serve customers and stakeholders. When that conviction is there, then it becomes a regular practice. Yeah, that is something very rich and very full of experience, uh, sir. You were saying those words from conviction to um, uh, discourse and then forum and then redressal. And for that, the key aspect is to make people speak and then hear and make them realize that whatever you are saying is actually being genuinely is uh, listened to and is implemented to bring the change in the entire organization, of course, with the support of enablers and policy and infrastructure, as you rightly mentioned. Thank you so much, sir. Trishala, uh, can you share your views on how you practice, how you make uh, this uh, transgender community um, to believe in themselves, to believe that they are no different? Because, of course, two-edge thing, like one side you have to make uh, people realize that let us accept them but the other side they should also you also need a lot of efforts to make them realize that you are no different and uh, you have abilities and capabilities how do you practice this concept in your organization uh, so what i've noticed so from my initial uh, perception uh, was very different and what i actually saw when i joined periphery was different and, and that people uh, that I've interacted from the community, they seem to be very, very strong. And, uh, you know, in terms of they know where they belong and they, they know they deserve it. So uh, in a way, we've had our uh, challenges as well, uh, where we try and, um, you know, uh, kind of bring them to be a part of more and more of an inclusive society as well. So in our organization itself, uh, we are a very small team, uh, around 10, 11 people. And uh, six to seven of them are from the community itself. And I think uh, here, what we are trying to do is to also lead by example. So uh, these uh, six, uh, six people in the team, actually, um, they uh, source people from the community for us. So uh, these are the people who source people for training batches and also for recruitment. So when they see uh, someone like them employed in an organization like Periphery, uh, so that is when they start believing that you know they are, there is a place for them as well so um and by that we've got we, the the people the kind of people who have been reaching out to us have been very very skilled and uh, the quality is uh, extremely high so uh, back when we used to do field works there's a lot of reluctance from the community and now i see that reluctance is kind of um, you know taking a back seat and they are able to uh, come forward and uh, reach out to the opportunities that are available for them so um, I think um, we've also kind of created a culture in the last five years uh, within the team itself to uh, 
uh, have a lot of conversation in and around gender and also within the transgender community uh, to understand each diverse individual uh, within the community as well. So, um, so another thing we also do is uh, conduct a lot of sensitization with the corporates and all of these sensitizations, we try and um, include the community individuals itself to run the sessions, right? So we also kind of advocate for the entire LGBTQIA spectrum, where uh, this gave, gave us an opportunity to interact people from all of these uh, communities. So um, it's kind of brought us all together. And I think uh, every day we learn from them. It's they who teach us you know, how to uh, create a culture like this. So I think uh, as a team, we're very, very grateful to have them guide us through the journey. So it's actually them showing us the way, sir. This is something uh, very interesting that, of course, learning is always good. And what we shared is really very real story the side of the coin, what we perceive in as about them, the condition of our mind make make us to you know derive at such statements but thank you so much for your views uh, dr lakshmi uh, if you can uh, add more about your uh, learnings while working with uh, the children and what kind of uh, practices that you would like to uh, suggest uh, to schools and universities and institutes uh, to apply these concepts sure um thank you dr vyas and so in my research, um, you know, I proposed a theoretical framework that guides implementation. And this framework, which I titled Inclusive by Design, utilizes universal design for learning as a central tenet that ensures that all students attain equitable access to the curriculum. So UDL actually originated in the architectural concept of universal design. And you know, the ramps that were constructed in buildings to comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act were actually very useful for many people. Originally intended for wheelchair users, it was used by mothers pushing strollers, older people with canes or walkers, uh, people who were blind, et cetera. So you know, this opened up access to the buildings for many more than who it was originally intended for. So similarly, universal design for learning is a framework to proactively design learning environments that are inclusive. Design features incorporated for students with disabilities benefit all students. By designing proactively, we actually reduce the stigma attached to providing supports. So that's in one way um, that, that, that I uh, work. The other thing that I, you know, want to kind of highlight is that inclusive, you know, practices refers to including, you know, children with disabilities in regular classrooms and over time has been implemented in many ways. You know, educators discuss this as an opportunity that allows uh, disabled students to be uh, placed in regular classrooms, but, you know, um, this, it may satisfy a legal requirement for the school, but it is really rooted in the deficit model, which seeks to diagnose, treat, or cure a problem. This deficit model is a problematic approach to inclusion because it essentializes um, people with disabilities as being a sum of their deficits. It bypasses other models of implementation that are situated instead in strengths-based perspectives like universal design for learning, and that view the disability as resulting from barriers that society erected. Traditional models of special ed place a diagnostic label on the student, making it appear as if the problem resides within the student, and thereby letting society off the hook. So what I really hope to do is aspire to change that narrative. I see equity for all students as ensuring equal opportunity, fair treatment, and access to education and resources. This is possible only in an environment built on respect and dignity, because just like Mr. Shivakumar said earlier, you have to be able to really listen to them, make those policy changes, and, and then kind of build that system of support that fosters a culture of belonging by actively seeking and valuing the participation and contribution of students and allowing social relationships to flourish and grow. Excellent, uh, Dr. Lakshmi, please allow me to congratulate you for um, providing such a framework and made it easy for further research and implementation, make it successful to contribute to the uh, society. Your research work will go a long way um, to <laughs> help many institutes, schools and colleges to, to learn from this model and make it possible in their uh, environment. Um, 
now uh, let me request uh, monica uh, if if you can share you have written books on uh, cultural diversity you have written books on uh, um uh, uh, equality i believe uh, if i am not wrong and also on uh, blockchain uh, and uh, how we will live in future so if you can help connect all these dots these different topics that you have selected for your um, different books and how you see that this practice is feasible and uh, implementable in various organization with which you had worked for thank you dr vyas so i must say i have contributed to these books so i publish a lot and write a lot of articles but there are interviews that are captured in this books there are chapters that i've contributed to there are blurbs that i've written for the books so blockchain reaction the future of how we live and work actually that book captures my journey my life story as an inspirational story and then talks about how we connect with blockchain and how can we make the most of the global workforce so just clarifying that since we are also live on youtube <laughs> So the ma'am, I wanted to say, Rekha ma'am, your vision will come true when disability becomes a commonplace. So wearing a specs is also a disability. Being diabetic is also a disability. But nobody is calling it a disability since it's so common. So when all of this becomes common, that's how everybody stops addressing anybody with a vision impairment or a deaf or a mute person. So that would happen. That's all. All of us are actually working towards. so it would eventually happen i've been having a fantastic time just listening to the panelists and then reading the nuggets of wisdom by professor nikhil in the chat so the first thing i want to say is um, this is my bread and butter as you rightly said dr vyas and this is what i do this is what my company does on an everyday basis so i also how uh, professor nikhil wrote i also practice what i preach so inclusion for me actually means having a voice at the table where everyone feels like every individual feels accepted respected valued and safe so they can be themselves and they can be authentic and as i said my personal slogan it's just branded everywhere uh, which is like be authentic be yourself but i say be bold as well and i make sure that my team my partners my customers all of them feel heard and seen and respected and amongst our team like so my team is about 100 plus professionals we are spread across geographies and i am actually the chief consultant for diversity equity and inclusion and since we are among students i would love for them to actually learn some of the buzzwords what work happens under diversity equity and inclusion so i help clients right from defining the business case for dei to actually advancing a culture of inclusion and innovation and what does that mean it means everything under the dei umbrella whether it's designing the dei strategy whether it's sponsorship programs mentoring programs employee resource groups the dei executive councils there are benchmarking surveys you know like best place to work for working mothers so there's leadership development programs um, there's also processes policies matrix scorecards that all fall under governance and accountability so that's generally the work we do and we support the clients with and trust me when i say this there are quite a few challenges in doing this work and it is exhausting the work is exhausting because everyone has an opinion on this no matter what so you speak about di they like ha gender diversity ha huh? hire more women ha huh? or training will fix for biases so literally everyone doesn't matter whether they even understand that dei are separate words they just lump together but they actually mean different thing things so i just quickly capture one of the challenges uh, that i have with clients when supporting this work is customers really don't know what they want so they either doing diversity equity inclusion because it's a world headquarter mandate and so they're running it in the region or at the country level or they see that their competition is doing it so they don't want to be left behind or this is also like a buzzword like a cool thing for them to do so that's how they want to do it and some of my clients have literally said they want to use their corporate social responsibility csr funds to just feel good about giving back to community there's nothing wrong in using your csr funds but that's not what dei is it's not corporate social responsibility and these are the companies that would later complain about their dei dollars being wasted or how there is no impact 
because they are just doing random initiatives. There's just tick box activities, one off uh, events happening. So they're not planning it with a strategic lens of actually aligning it with a business strategy and with their HR strategy. And let me just stop there because I can go about this topic for two months in a row. Great. So thank you, Monica, for keeping it very precise and brief. Uh, we are already 6.44 behind schedule by 14 minutes. Uh, now the last round is pending and may I request panelists to share in two, three sentences your expectations from the young generation. Um, what you would like to advise them, what you would like to suggest them, and um, any policy change that you would like to propose to the authorities, uh, if we can keep it very short, maybe three to five sentences per panelist, please. Rekha, madam, starting with you. Yes. We should have started uh, what with I, you to save time. What, what I feel is each one has to be very honest to himself and herself. If I am honest in, prof in uh, talking about inclusion, I have to be honest. So an honest person is definitely respected and understood better. So let us be honest and address all our conflicts you know, in, in, a, uh, in a light way. Do not take them far, far away. All our stress should be at low level. It's not because at this age you think this lady is talking about, say, I am. I am honestly, even 20 years back, I was stress-free and I was, uh, I could address all the conflicts. And that is because to me, stress, it comes with uh, problems. There is no problem without a solution. So solve the problem and your stress is gone. Okay. So this is, if this keeps you stress free and, you know, happy, no conflicts. I don't have any enemies. You are an honest person and you can profess any, you know, you know policy and follow it honestly. That's it. And inclusion has come to stay. Our attitude will make it successful. Thank you. So, Ajat Shatru, Rekha Madam, thank you so much for your uh, wonderful piece of advice. Uh, Shiv Kumar, sir, your turn, please. So, to honesty, I will add the word empathy as another thing that uh, you must bring in uh, to the students as a message. You know, how do you get a sense of empathy and feel uh, for everyone that you are interacting with, that you come across. I think that really is a starting point. And, uh, uh, you know, realize that everyone around has the potential. It is just that sufficient opportunity may not be there sometimes, or sufficient resource or support may not be available. And uh, lastly, uh, recognize that each of us have our own biases that we don't realize and uh, try to be aware of the biases and work on them and the uh, rest of the things will fall in place. Wonderful, sir. Really very precise and very great piece of advice. I'm sure the young generation must be feeling so fortunate and lucky to hear from uh, legends sitting here. Uh, empathy is the key word as sir has rightly mentioned and everything that we have uh, you can read even in chat box from Professor Nikhil's con wonderful contribution throughout the session. Uh, now, may I come to uh, Trishala, your views, please. I think all of us should start by unlearning. So there are a lot of things that we've, you know, uh, that people have passed down to us that we need to firstly unlearn and uh, try and expose yourself as much as possible. I was exposed to it as, as young as 2021. 20, and uh, always be curious to learn about it. Something as basic as gender, uh, you know, has a lot to, uh, you know, learn about. And uh, I think uh, go back to your basics, start from scratch. And uh, yeah, just expose yourself to every opportunity you get. I've benefited a lot from it, I'm sure. All of you will as well. Yeah. You are an asset, Trishala, for periphery and for this society. Thank you so much for your uh, words full of wisdom. Um, Dr. Lakshmi? Sorry, I have to just, I forgot to unmute myself. So just, you know, actually piggybacking to on what Trishala said in terms of unlearning, you know, we all believe that average is a reliable index of normality. We need to unlearn that 
I think people are very multidimensional. We have different experiences, backgrounds, and people are not one dimensional from struggling to gifted. And if we understand how we design context can actually be disabling for some people, I think that is, if I can leave you with something, that's what I would leave you with. The other thing I would encourage you as students to do is to actually read the book, The End of Average by Todd Rose. He's from the Harvard Mind, Brain and Education Institute. And um, he talks about the science of individuality. I would en really encourage you to read that um, to understand more. Um, thank you, doctor. If you can kindly put that name of book uh, in the chat box, please, so that everyone would be benefited if it's possible for you at your end. Thank so, you. Um, I don't have um, access to the to put the, in the chat box. I can I think only put it to Q and A. All right. And I I, yeah. I can put it to Q and A so they can put it in the chat box. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, Monica, please go ahead. Thank you. So, adding on to what uh, Trishala said, going back to basics. So, remember how or what our parents actually taught us as children is treat the way you would like to be treated. I say go beyond it now and treat the people the way they want to be treated. So, yes, be courteous, be an ally. Respect everyone, uh, regardless of others' uh, identity and backgrounds. Be bold. Let's all pl pledge actually to make a difference. So the first thing you should really try and do as students or at this age is make friends with people who are not like you. So increase your network. That's how you would become more aware. So get out of your comfort zones there, and that would help you be more inclusive. But really at your, a, your age, I would say 20s is all about experimentation. Just experiment, take risks, man. Be bold, be, be, be whatever you are. That's what your principle and mantra is. So fantastic uh, three rounds, friends, we have completed. And I'm happy that um, there are more than 85 friends who are participating right now, apart from the panelists. And beyond that, on YouTube, uh, there might be other members who are watching it live. So now, uh, can we have a question answer uh, session? Um, over to you, Gail, please. Yes, sir. I hope all of you, I hope all of you enjoyed this uh, wonderful uh, session and words, words of wisdom. Uh, yes, sir. Um, that was such an interesting discussion. It was a wonderful and insightful experience to be part of the audience. In fact, the audience has been actively sending a ton of questions throughout. And uh, I'd like to request Dr. Vyas to direct these questions to our panelists. So our first question is a two-part question. Um, how can organizations integrate a culture of meritocracy and diversity? And what are the steps that an organization can take to address the feelings or perceptions of partiality or injustice triggered by measures to promote DEI? Uh, sorry, I missed uh, unmuting. Before I uh, request this question to Shiv Kumar, sir, may I request Gail to again repeat the question? It's really a pretty long question. Please, please yes, of course. Shiv Kumar, sir, will address this because it's yes. about organizational practices. Uh, so the first part of the question is how can organizations integrate a culture of meritocracy and diversity? And the second part is what are the steps that an organization can take to address feelings or perceptions of partiality or injustice triggered by measures to promote DEI? So the gist of the question is really when you think about hiring for diversity, you think like organizations are lowering the bar. That's what is the gist. Yeah, uh, like, like I was responding uh, to the first question by uh, Professor Vyas, when you look at a transaction level, it appears that you may be diluting uh, meritocracy, and uh, which is a foundational principle of uh, performance management or outcomes management. But when you go beyond and put 
certain enablers in place, you will be able to uh, manage both. That's where the power of and comes. When you look at these as this or that, there's a tyranny in that. Uh, if you say that an enabler is how do I create a resource to train uh, whoever that I want to include or wherever that I want to have a diversified kind of a workforce and then provide that equal opportunity to promote that meritocracy. So how do you create those enablers uh, is one way to bridge uh, both of these uh, aspects. The other route is to understand the different abilities. Quite often when you create an equal parameter and say that that's the only lens through which I look, then you say what is merit and what is not merit. But when I say I have a different levels of ability and in an organization you work in a team, how do I get the complementarity into a team? Someone is good at this, someone else is good at something else and someone is a third thing. All three put together is how organizations become uh, and the teams become much stronger. And that's when you see that it is the whole team uh, succeeds. It is not one's merit versus the other merit, but one's merit with another's different kind of merit getting combined. Uh, these two uh, is what I would look at as my response to the, the first question. And uh, second, uh, in a way, is uh, around the response that I had given to the second question of Professor Vyas, is in terms of more dialogue uh, is a route and then resolution after that dialogue. People should get a chance to express uh, of a prejudice that may be there. And once the expression is done, you have that uh, dialogue so that an alternative view is also understood and then it is resolved. That's an ongoing process. More communication, more dialogue and uh, resolution uh, is the route to ensure that uh, the positivity exists in the organization. May I just add to what you're saying in a couple of lines, you know, like what Andra Nui said, diversity means getting like the best and the brightest on board. So actually, this is a myth that needs to be busted that uh, you are lowering the bar when you're hiring for diverse talent. Because if you really want the best and the brightest in your company, you'll have to draw from the whole population. So you don't have to necessarily lower the bar when it comes to performance, but you do have to open the door wider to include those who are routinely overlooked. Thank you for answering that question. I'm sure students are benefiting greatly from these insights. Um, the and second question that has been put forth is, it seems that diversity can sometimes hinder team productivity. How do you build capability to identify when and how to leverage diversity to the fullest? Um, I think, uh, Trishala, you would like to respond? Uh, I'm sorry, Gail, can you repeat the question? Yes, of course. It seems that diversity can sometimes hinder team productivity. How do you build capability to identify when and how to leverage diversity to the fullest. Okay, so um, so personally, what I've seen is uh, I've uh, I think I've gained a lot more uh, insight about another person's strengths uh, through um, through what they identify as a self. So I think diversity adds a lot of uh, value in terms of um, us trying to identify work on our strengths, right? So if I if I know that someone, uh, let's say I have a colleague, Preeti, uh, she is physically uh, able and, and disabled. So uh, she has her challenges as well, right? So, and uh, I, I feel like certain things, she has her strengths to play in when it comes to certain aspects of the business. And I have my, my strengths to play on when it comes to certain aspects. And just to be aware of uh, each other and aware of the capabilities of each other, I think that would be greatly helpful. And I, and I feel like diversity is definitely a huge plus when it comes to a team, whether it's an organization or a team, it's just about being aware of, uh, you know, how much you can contribute and how much the other person can contribute. And if we are aware and we're able to accept uh, each other's contributions and each other's strengths, I think that should uh, itself create kind of a healthy space to work within. 
Thank you, Mr. Shala. That was a wonderful answer to the question. Um, our next question is, who must drive DEI in large organizations? What is your take on several modern organizations having a dedicated DEI head? Uh, um, I believe uh, this is a question right for Monica, having a lot of organizational contacts and case studies. Monica, if you could please. Sure. And I want to say uh, also to what Prashala said, it's not easy. Diversity is not easy. It takes a lot of time and effort. But as students just understand, why would organizations need DEI in the first place? It is to drive, like to get those fresh perspectives, to actually get out of your comfort zone, which would like finally drive innovation, creativity, that collaboration would drive it. Finally, it all adds to the company's top line and bottom line. And hence, all organizations have made it like a mindset and a business strategy. So what, this actually aligns with the question you have asked, the next question, that um, for the organizations that think it may be an initiative or a HR thing to do, it is not. It's really the mindset. It is the mindset that's rooted deep in emotional intelligence. And it is not something that needs to be rolled out by just HR or by leadership. Yes, you should start always for big initiatives. You need a buy-in from the C-suite and from the senior leadership, those stakeholders. But then every single person has accountability to build the skills that support this mindset. So it is about how you interact with your team every day. It is a way of life. Um, just being diverse and inclusive is also about uh, what I said, being, being able to bring those uh, different experiences, backgrounds, perspectives, thought processes to the table, and then making sure that you create that environment that actually would allow them to bring the uniqueness they were first hired for, the ones that they possess. So everyone is responsible for championing DEI to some degree. And uh, just when you go to the corporate place, also just remember, it's not just the right thing to do or an ethics or morality or CSR thing, it's a business strategy, but you start with data, you start at the top, that's where you start. Thank you for addressing the thought-provoking questions from our audience. Uh, I do apologize to our audience members whose questions we couldn't take up as we are really short on time right now. Um, moving on, uh, before we bring this panel discussion to an end, I have delightful news to share with everyone present. Uh, the 10th International HR Conference has partnered with six journals of international repute, which are BNC category and Scopus Index. We are happy that uh, the journal editor, Dr. Rajeshi Ghosh, uh, is here with us today, and I would like to introduce her. Uh, Dr. Rajeshi Ghosh is the editor-in-chief of Human Resource Development International one of the flagship peer-reviewed journals in the field of HRD, and also an editorial board member of the premium journal, Human Resource Development Review. Her research aims to explore how different development initiatives can facilitate workplace learning and development through building inclusive, inclusive recreational spaces and uh, countering the prevalence of workplace incivility. Uh, I would like to thank you for attending this session. Uh, I now invite Dr. Vidya Thakkar to say a few words about the 10th International Human Resource Conference and propose a vote of thanks. Thank, <clears throat> thank you so much, Gail. Uh, this was indeed a very, very delightful, um, enriching session. And uh, my no duty is more urgent than expressing gratitude. And gratitude is the only way that we all can grow and expand. And it brings a lot of laughter and joy to each one of us. Uh, and my heartfelt gratitude to everybody present here, uh, first and foremost, uh, all the panelists to whom we reached out uh, way back in uh, January or February. And uh, very readily, each of them agreed uh, to be part of the uh, <clears throat> part of this panel discussion and uh, took out time from their very busy schedule. So I really would uh, thank <clears throat> Sir Kumar Sir, uh, Rekha Ma'am, uh, Lakshmi, Dr. Lakshmi, uh, Monica, and uh, Trishala 
for uh, taking out precious time and enlightening all of us over here with their wonderful anecdotes and experience sharing. Uh, so uh, heartfelt thanks to you. Uh, just a quick <clears throat> brief introduction about uh, what we would be doing in January 2023. I extend a very warm uh, invitation to all of you to be part of our 10th International HR Conference. Uh, being 10, it's very, very special. And this can become a success only when all of you are going to be there along with us, supporting us and uh, sharing more of your knowledge and experience with us. So we have three main um, activities or events during the uh, <clears throat> international conference, which, is, which will be in hybrid mode. Uh, first, we would have the uh, inaugural session, and uh, we have two speakers uh, on both the days of the session, Dr. Sondarya Rajesh and Ritu Anand, who is the uh, diversity head at TCS, and she would be sharing her experience of um, leading the diversity team at TCS. And Dr. Sondarya Rajesh uh, is working at the grassroots level and doing phenomenal work in this particular space. So she would be sharing her ideas, her knowledge with all of us. Uh, we have a workshop which will be conducted by Access Bank uh, by uh, Vejanti, who led, leads the um, DEI initiative over there. Uh, other than this, we will also be giving, uh, we will also be having several tracks where academicians, researchers, and practitioners can present their papers, case studies, and uh, presentations so that we all can learn from each other and get to know the wonderful work which is happening for social transformation. Other than this, we would be very soon updating our um, a conference brochure and we'll be sending it to all of you where there would be details about the research-based workshop which we would be conducting during the session. So I request all of you to definitely make it convenient to attend the conference uh, offline would be best. If not, at least join us online. Taking this further, I would like to thank, other than the panelists, I would definitely extend my heartfelt thank to Dr. Vipul Vyas for seamlessly moderating today's session and coordinating with the uh, panelists uh, since the last one month uh, as to how we can conduct the session. Thank you so much, uh, Vyas, sir. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Monica Khanna for encouraging and um, giving us this opportunity to host this conference. Uh, Dr. Shailja Karve, our ACP, I really thank you for always supporting us and, and empowering us to take decisions to decide who we would call for being in the panel and everything where you have always been there to support us. I thank all my colleagues at the HR department uh, for constantly giving us ideas and being there to listen whenever we wanted to clarify something or share something with you. My dear students of the Team Humanist, uh, forever grateful to you uh, for your enthusiasm in the success of this evening's uh, performance. Thank you so much. Uh, the PR team, I, we could not have uh, conducted to this evening's session without your uh, support without the <clears throat> publicity that you people helped us with, the beautiful cr creatives that was sent out to various parts of the world and which has been the result of the number of participants who have attended today's session. Last but not the least, I thank the IT team uh, for ensuring that we all remain com connected over Zoom uh, with their IT support. And uh, Zoom has definitely made all of us realize that the world has shrunk. Uh, we all are sitting in the comforts of our home, but sharing beautiful, wonderful knowledge. Finally, without God's grace, this evening's program could not have happened. So definitely uh, thank God for ensuring that we all could be here together, learning from each other. Finally, I request all of you that to stand for the national anthem and before we part. Okay. We 
are not able to hear the sound, please. Can you restart? Yeah, now it's... I'd like to thank 